It's another Saturday, another brisk, cold day, windy day here in Spokane, Washington. I hope that you're staying warm and cozy and comfortable and everything's going fine wherever you are. And now I just invite you to put on the brakes, grab a cup of coffee. I almost couldn't say that right. I might need some coffee. Put on the brakes, grab a cup of coffee and join the conversation because it is time once again for Coffee Breaks with Steve. I definitely needed that, obviously, because the mouth isn't quite warmed up yet this morning. Good morning to all of you. Welcome to Coffee Breaks with Steve on this Saturday, January 28th. Once again, it's hard to believe how quickly the months go by and, and even ultimately the years. I mean, we're basically through the first month of 2023. If you were tuning in live, welcome. And I just invite you to say hello in the chat here so we know that you're here just also invite you as we get into our topic today to make sure that you're part of the conversation. That's what this is about. We're all sitting around our virtual coffee table this morning. What are you drinking this morning? Are you having your coffee? Are you having your tea? Are you having your whatever it might be? Let us know what you're consuming there and, and what the weather's like. Oh, boy, a bunch of people tuned in already. So I guess I better say my hellos here. I see that Corey Ann is here. I see uh, Jerry Zetterval, Scott Glavin. Rick Venturi, Kathy Garlic, Jay Zetterval, Kathy Glavin. Hi, hi, Kathy. Um, and Emily, Emily Snow, you are here. I know that you weren't sure if you were going to be able to, to make it live, but welcome, Emily. Hi, Fabiola. Good to see you. And I think I saw a couple of other people out there who are watching and didn't necessarily say hi in the chat. Do so if you feel comfortable doing that. If you are tuning in later and watching this as a recorded program, you can still take part in the chat. If you're on Facebook, uh, you should still be able to make comments in the chat along the way as you're watching this and be part of the conversation as well. So I invite you to do that and welcome you just as much. And uh, just a reminder that Coffee Breaks with Steve, in addition to being on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, it's available recorded on both of those platforms and will be also available probably by tomorrow at the latest uh, on our podcast sites on Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. So you can also go out and catch it there or refer your friends there. Okay. What's going on this week? It, um, it's, a, it's an interesting week uh, as we get from January into February. And let's see if I can, let's see if I can hit the right buttons this morning. That's the other thing that has to happen. We have some special days this week, January 28th to February 3rd. Uh, today is Data Privacy Day. Several months ago, we had um, Chris on here to talk about cybersecurity, but data privacy goes really beyond that. Think about not only your password safety, but keeping your credit card information and other things secure when you're online. So this is a day that they encourage that you kind of take the day, maybe because it's a Saturday, it's a good day to do it. But it's January 28th every year to go through and just kind of check uh, all of your sites and all of your data security and make sure, kind of double check everything. Not a bad idea to run a credit report and, and do all of those things. So that apparently is what today's about. It's also... I should have grabbed a kazoo for this. It's National Kazoo Day. Any of you ever play a kazoo? And, and be honest, how many of you would honestly say that you own a kazoo right now? Some of you actually do. I know that for a fact. But uh, I remember having created, remember creating kazoo bands when we were kids? And you'd have, and you could even create them. You could make a makeshift kazoo with a piece of wax paper and a hair comb. And, and you vibrate against it and it would make that buzzy sound. So today is national because I love when they say national and you know for a fact that it wasn't because Congress passed a bill or the president made a proclamation. It's it just a national day. Tomorrow is National Puzzle Day. Are you a puzzle person? And if so, what kind of puzzles? They're jigsaw puzzles, crossword puzzles, people like Sudoku. They like jumbles. Uh, I, I'm into different kinds of puzzles and I like to do puzzles that are kind of mind mind bending you know kind of try to keep my brain alive and keep me young uh, we during the holidays particularly we will pull out the jigsaw puzzles and have a table set up with those 
I, I don't see Shalane on here. Oh, she is on here. Sorry. Hello, Shalane. Um, and if, is there anybody else I haven't said hi to? Trying to keep track of everybody. But uh, yeah, National Puzzle Day. So what kind of puzzles do you and your family like to put together? What is your puzzle preference? And, and I, do, I guess National Puzzle Day isn't necessarily the only day of the year to do a puzzle, but it may be a good time to go back and I've got to go through a box every now and then and even see. We've got jigsaw puzzles. I don't think we've ever taken out of the box. It's time to start setting those up. The last Monday in January, so on, on this coming Monday, the 30th, is Bubble Wrap Appreciation Day. Okay, come on. We all know bubble wrap in and of itself is therapeutic. We all love bubble wrap. We all love to, to be able to pop those bubbles. And you can even get apps on your phone so that you can, you can virtually pop bu bubbles. I'm not sure. I guess it kind of fills that void, right? But there's something about actually physically having those bubbles between your thumb and your finger and popping them that feels good for some reason. But it's not on, always on a specific date. It is always the last Monday in January. So I expect to hear a lot of bubbles popping on Monday because that's apparently the day to do it. January 20, 31st, January 31st is National Backward Day. And you'll see, I know a lot of the schools will commemorate that by having the kids, encouraging kids to come wearing like their shirts backwards and you can do different things to commemorate Backward Day. Some people like to play music backward. It drives me nuts a little bit to do that. Coming from a musical background kind of throws me a little bit to hear music backwards. But that's the 31st is National Backward Day. Celebrate that. But there are a lot, probably a lot of jokes here, too. But just celebrate that however you feel so inclined. We could all use this one. No matter where you are, no matter what your leanings are, I think we could all agree that it's not a bad idea to have a no politics day. February 1st is no politics day. It's a day to ignore all of the political opinions, all of the political pundits, all of the stuff that's on the news, which probably means not turning on the news at all, but celebrate no politics day on, uh, on the, the February 1st, which is Wednesday, right? Wow. Wednesday already, we're going to be into the next month. Hey, one of my favorite holidays, I think I've talked about this before, going back to my high school days, we all, all of the, my gang of, of friends, some of you on here are, were at least on the fringes of that gang, because there are people on here that I've known since high school. And, uh, but my, my friends and I would come up with excuses to have a little get together and we weren't big partiers, you know, we didn't sneak alcohol and that kind of stuff. It was just get together with some soda pop and some potato chips and dips and and maybe play some games or put together some puzzles but we each picked a pseudo holiday that would be our responsibility to set up and host and do everything and i chose groundhog day i just thought it was one at the time there was no groundhog day movie that was not one that was a a big deal. You'd see something on the news about the groundhog seeing a shadow or not seeing a shadow, but it wasn't a huge deal. And so for me, it was just a way to pick something that would otherwise have been somewhat obscure to come up with a reason to get together and have a party. Over the years, it kind of became this thing where my friends would reach out to me even well after high school. I'd get cards in the mail. I would get phone calls. Um, one year, a friend of mine even sent me a telegram back when those were still something that you would get physically. I actually had a telegram delivered to my door wishing me a happy Groundhog Day. My family would contact me. And to this day, it's not unlikely that on Groundhog Day on Thursday, I'll get a variety of private messages on Facebook, maybe even just face Facebook comments. Um, I'll probably get some text messages. I may get some phone calls. People to this day still help me celebrate Groundhog Day, and that's coming up this week. We know the actual, the, the real serious purpose for Groundhog Day is to find out if we're going to have six more weeks of winter or not, because the groundhog obviously is able to predict that. Uh, we don't have groundhogs here. The groundhogs are more prevalent, the actual groundhog, in the south and in the eastern part of the United States. But we do have marmots here, which are cousins, direct cousins of the groundhog. And they look a lot like groundhogs. And I get a kick out of seeing the marmots in our area, although a lot of people see them as pests. We have some birthdays coming up this week that I want to also recognize and celebrate. Carol Siegel, Carol and John Siegel, friends, uh, we're on Coffee Breaks with Steve a few months ago talking about life in New York. 
And uh, we actually got to spend some time with Carol and John when we were in New York before uh, in, in November. It was a couple of months ago. Hang on. One of those mornings. And and we'll talk about it a little bit later. But uh, John Siegel, Jonathan Siegel, I shouldn't say John. He doesn't go by John. Jonathan Siegel is going to be back on Coffee Breaks with Steve very soon to talk about a project he's been working on. But it's Carol Siegel's birthday on the 30th. So happy birthday, Carol. Derek Nelson, a musician, a music educator, also has been a guest on Coffee Breaks with Steve, friend of Coffee Breaks with Steve. Derek will also be back to see us here in a few weeks. But Derek is celebrating a birthday. Birth, <laughs> it's going to be one of those mornings, I can tell. Is celebrating a birthday on January 31st. And then Dustin, Shepherd Hoppus. Dustin is celebrating a birthday on Groundhog Day. Another reason to celebrate that day. So happy birthday to all of you. Do you have a special day coming up this week? You can put that in the chat. I'm looking to see if anybody has put anything up there yet, but we want to celebrate with you. If you do have a special day coming up uh, this week that we can also say happy birthday, happy anniversary, happy bar mitzvah. Maybe it's your child's birthday. Maybe it's your spouse's birthday. Maybe it's just another special day that you celebrate in a big way like Groundhog Day, but let us know. And if you have a special day coming up in February that you want to make sure we include when we're talking about our special days, you can email at coffeebreakswithsteve at comcast.net. We'll grab that information. We'll make sure that we include your special day in what we are doing. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you something. You know why it's good that I have guests on this show? It's because I can, I can talk nonstop for 40 plus minutes. I just don't think it's necessarily a good idea. Um, all right. I want to now move on to our topic, and I want to introduce our special guests today. And I want to tell you a little bit about uh, their project, and I want to tell you about our topic today and a little bit about them, and then we're just going to bring them right in here. But uh, Brandon and Whitney Kaywood, after discovering that their child has a life-altering sensitivity to synthetic dyes, they their dad, Brandon, who you're going to meet in a minute, is a first time filmmaker. And along with his wife, Whitney, they're in the process of documenting their journey to unravel the impacts of synthetic dyes. They journey to meet with the world's leading synthetic dye experts as they conduct in-person interviews with scientists and psychiatrists, leading to an unexpected series of shocking stories and surprising discoveries. Now, Brandon and Whitney are married with two children, ages four and two years old. Brandon is a full-time commercial photographer and videographer, so moving toward documentary filmmaking was not outside the realm of reality for him, but still a first-time project. Whitney is an e-commerce business owner with a background in education and marketing. So, Without any further ado, I would just like to introduce uh, now and bring on board here Brandon and Whitney. Good morning or afternoon, whatever the case may be. You guys are located where? In Georgia. In Georgia. So what time is it in Georgia right now? 12, 12.40. That's what I thought. So good afternoon to the two of you and welcome to Coffee Breaks with Steve. Hello. Good afternoon. Glad to be here. Well, um, this time worked out well for us because our kids are napping. So if they come out at any point. <laughs> that's okay. Then they joined the conversation too. We okay. have that happen. That's not at all an issue. But I, I know I was telling our director before the show, I said, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see Brandon and Whitney get in here and, and try to get organized because they've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old. That's <laughs> always got to be a fun juggling act. Oh, yeah. So you, your backgrounds did not make it necessarily um, – outside the realm of possibility that you would be doing some some filmmaking at some point. And I don't know, we can talk about whether that was ever in and of itself a goal or a dream of yours. But, and we've talked a little bit about this, but, but Whitney and Brandon, I'd like you to just talk a little bit more about the plot of the film, what this documentary is really about, and what really prompted you to decide through your journey that making a documentary film was the way to go. Okay, so... Um, as you said, and when, when you were talking about it, our, we discovered that our son has a neurological reaction to synthetic dyes, and uh, by that by that we mean it's a it's a behavioral reaction. So it's um, and what's crazy is like throughout the filming of this documentary, like every family that we've interacted with, it's almost like a Doctor Jekyll and, Ms., and Mr. Hyde type thing. You know, they're our our 
child is very sweet, very kind. <clears throat> but we, we would just go through these episodes of behavior that was uncontrollable and like uh, impulses, no impulse control and, and, and stuff like that. And sleeping problems, sleeping mm-hmm. problems. And so after discovering like what was going on with us and working through it and figuring out that diets were the issue, um, Whitney kind of got in some Facebook groups to kind of talk to other parents and, and find out tips and how people were, were living die free and shopping die free groceries and stuff like that. And that kind of led to her realizing that there's a lot of people that this is affecting. Um, and if there's this many people that know that's affecting them, there's probably millions way more than that that don't know that this yeah. is something that could be affecting the child's behavior. So, right. um, so she approached me about us doing something like this. And like you said, it wasn't outside of the realm of possibility. I've done a short film um, and I've done some other little film projects like that. But most of my work is, you know, shorter. It's like short form. So commercials and, and things like that. But it was it, ever since we started, you know, I started doing video work and knowing that was a thing. We've always talked about potentially one day doing a documentary or d- working on some sort of project. Um, and so that's kind of kind of where it led. And it's it's we, when we started it. We thought it would be, you know, something small. And uh, we had no idea who we would interview or or how we would go about finding people to talk, but it's kind of evolved into, into this thing where we're, you know, we're interviewing the leading researchers in the world on this topic. And literally our A team, like everyone that we wanted, starting with Emily, um, which is your good friend, all of our A team is, is literally our cast. Like it's, um, it's been a God thing, like the, the, the whole way through. Um, and obviously we were equipped to do it in terms of equipment, like literally equipped. And then our, our talents, it just, um, it lined up really well. So it's, it's been crazy to see it come together. Um, but like Brandon said, it was something that for about a year and a half, we thought that it was just a really uncommon reaction. We, didn't know anyone else that had ever had this type of a reaction to synthetic dyes um, to the, to the extent where 48 hours off of synthetic dyes, we met a child that we had only had glimpses of before. Um, so we went off of dyes when he was three. Um, he was a new three. So it, it was just crazy things that would normally be hard for him to emotionally cope with. He was just like, okay. And if you were to know him now, like he literally got an award a couple weeks ago for integrity in his pre-K. Like <laughs> he's like a the sweetest, kindest, most polite, most gentle child. Um, so it's just the the fact that something that we ate, and we even before that, I tend to eat like cleaner. I I thought that we were eating clean. Yeah. He had chronic ear infections, so he would always have Benadryl or Tylenol to cope with that or an antibiotic until he had tubes. So during this season, it was every other day he was getting some kind of medication with red dye 40 and the reaction lasts up to 48 hours. So it was like we were he was constantly on a red dye 40 loop, Um, but it it was incredible. Just 48 hours later. Uh, just 48 There's hours. There's somebody now. Yeah. <laughs> Going potty. All right. Yeah. You know, it. I think about this and it just raises so many questions. I think about our own kids during their upbringing and things that, you know, for, for your son, there were some very significant issues that you were seeing. Other people, it may seem more subtle. Yep. 100%. Right. And, yeah. and I would imagine that was one of the eye openers too to this process yeah. in talking to different people and learning about it and and probably part of the reason for trying to get more information out there because I think about my own kids when they were kids and 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 grandkids now and other people we know who have kids who talk, they talk about whether it's an acting up type of issue or we hear about you know conditions of ADHD um, sleeping issues, sleeping through the night, even at an older age and these various things, you were already discovering a lot before you started putting this film together. What were the biggest eye openers for you have been the biggest eye openers for you in the process of making the film itself that were revelations you didn't already know through your research? Yeah. So our buddy, we're <laughs> <laughs> to go to your room. Okay. Go lay down and go to sleep. 
Um, so I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not a problem. For his his reaction is pretty uncommon, um, even among reactions. It, it is really intense. Um, for for a lot of children and even adults, it's um, they may have an underlying condition. Like our child does not um, literally die solved all of our issues, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, but for a lot of people, they may have ADHD and then they may have some trauma. And then for something to slightly alter their ability to cope emotionally just makes it so much worse. Um, but I can say the most eye opening aspect to me is one um, from the researchers we spoke to, um, Dr. Joel Nigg, he has said that there's a range with kids with ADHD, which there's a sign in the U.S. We have a significant amount of children with ADHD that but between five and eight um, percent have a reaction to synthetic dyes, whether it's huge or small, okay. it's still a neurologic reaction that's negatively impacting them. Um, but also Dr. Stevenson in London, he's the researcher that um, is the reason why UK has a warning label. No, the European Union. The, the European the Union, the EU, um, why they have a warning label that says may cause hyperactivity in, in some children. Okay. Um, he said that his study, he did studies on the general population. So he pulled from like children that didn't have ADHD, autism or, or any kind of underlying condition. And he found that one percent of children are are reactive to it, which is in the U.S. Millions of kids. Millions. Yeah. Well, like three million people. Yeah. One percent would be like three over three million. The, just yeah. the one percent. Because yeah, you hear that you hear that percent. You go, OK, not a big deal. But you got to think about how that relates to the yeah. total population. What's that number and how many yeah. families are impacted like that? And, that, and that, all, those numbers are all like very like like. You know, that's like conservative. conservative numbers on that. Well, so. yeah, because I would imagine, you know, there's been there's been information out or there's been a lot of controversy, let's say, about things like the red dye for a number of years. I can remember for years and years seeing things about the potential issues of various kinds, health issues connected to red dye 40. Is that what I'm yes. thinking of? There are probably others. Mm -hmm. But I, I would think that it's still one of those things we're trying to really capture how many people, how many kids, but we're going to talk in a minute. I want to talk about adults as well. Mm -hmm. How many people are impacted by this? Because I would imagine capturing those numbers is still based on research that's fairly young and, and not necessarily all inclusive in terms of knowing how to capture that. Because I, I would guess that in spite of everything, a lot of the medical community doesn't really recognize this in full and documentation regarding issues, neurological issues, physical, behavioral issues tied to synthetic dyes probably still hasn't been compiled fully. Yeah. Well, the reality is researchers are really good at doing research and then they publish that work. Physicians, they go through school, um, largely you don't, after your work, you don't go home and you look up new research. They, they just, I, I honestly don't think it's a matter of, they don't believe it. I just don't think they've seen the research because right. synthetic dyes have had how many humans? Well, studies? so we, we've done two interviews, one with uh, Lisa, um, who, who used to work for Center for the Science and the Public Interest, and another one with Thomas, um, what's Thomas's last name? Gallagher. Okay, he, he currently works for the the. Center for Science, Center for Science and Public Interest. Interest. And uh, they were saying that of all the food additives, um, synthetic dyes have the most amount of studies with humans. Um, so like if the, the, so more okay. than any other additive on the wow. market, synthetic dyes good. have been studied with very, very damning evidence. Like none of it is good. For instance, Red 3, the FDA, even on their website, you can go to the FDA's website and they've done studies on their own that have where they have had lab mice. They fed, they've ingested red three. And mice, and the mice, who, mice who consumed the red three had more, they had more uh, instances tumor of instances tumors. of tumors than yeah. the mice who didn't. So they actually banned red three in cosmetics in the 1990 or 1991, sometime around there. 1990. But they're still in foods like lots of foods that we eat like um, well i guess we should say the names yeah well yeah it's, it's like, bad like foods that you would like children's foods medications 
It's very difficult to find antibiotics, medication for ADHD, seizure medicine. There isn't a single, at our Kroger, there isn't a single antibiotic that's liquid that doesn't have red dye 40 or red it. three. Yeah, we have to order it special to get it. And for us, it's not like a matter of limiting. For many families, limiting is probably good. It's a dose dependent thing. The more yeah. you eat, the more it affects you. But for us, literally just a small amount can significantly throw our child off for 48 hours. So we we have to completely avoid it um, for his sanity and ours. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of comment down here. Emily said that red three is still in medication. So yeah, that's definitely still in medication. I think one of the big ones, which is kind of a, this is a crazy uh, occurrence. So um, Vyvanse, right? Vyvanse. Oh, say names. Okay. Well, Vyvanse is an ADHD medication. I mean, you right? can look it up. Yeah. So sure. Vyvanse, I, this is public information. You can yeah, find right. this. You're not. And Pediasure. That's the one that blew my mind. Pediasure. We have, um, our son was also premature, just slightly. He was a macro okay. preemie, so he was um, just barely premature. But we still did a stint in the NICU, and weight was an issue with us. Um, yeah, sure. And so to think the most vulnerable population, your doctors say, here, give them this Pediasure was, Absolutely. was mm -hmm. really um, surprising to me. Um, but I, th I think probably the most surprising thing to me was to find that um, – that the FDA knew that red three caused cancer since 19. I'm, I'm 32. So that's before I was alive. They yeah. knew that red three caused right. cancer and they, t they removed it from cosmetics, but not in our food. And I, I'm not somebody who believes that there are these horrible people sitting on a hill trying to kill us. It's, it's not that it's just a matter of people aren't talking about it. And they are probably worried about other things that people are talking about. And, and this is something that if, if you are concerned about synthetic dyes and the safety of synthetic dyes, we need to use each of us, use our platform to talk about that. Whether yeah. you are on the school board, whether you're just a mom on a play day or you're in politics, um, wh wherever you are on a podcast, like use your mm -hmm. platform to talk about it and to educate people because if politicians um, and, and the FDA don't believe that we care about it, then they're going to worry about the things that we care about. So The squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? I mean, it's that old adage that if you want something to change, you have to become a, a voice. You have to become an advocate. If, if necessary, you have to become a, a foot soldier. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we kind of feel like maybe that's what this, uh, this film can be is kind of that missing link. So like she said before, researchers are really good at doing research and, and, uh, and doing these studies, but they're not really marketers. And then, mm -hmm. um, you know, so what causes change, especially in this day and time is, is like public outcry for change yes. and, and just the virality and like the, the way the documentaries work and people can spend an hour and a half watching something and get all this information. Um, that's kind of, we feel like this could be a missing link to help, to help get some things. Yeah. It's our goal to connect like research, although I'm college educated, reading research makes my mind uh, feel like it's going to explode. Yeah. Like even the abstract is it's confusing to me. Um, so we're trying to connect these Ph.D. researchers that live in this academia world to just like the regular general public in a way that is scientific, but also easy to understand. And yeah. and, and there's a documentary that has some form of entertainment value. So. You know, we want it to be high quality, we want it to to be fun to watch and interesting to watch. And so that's because that's typically I mean, people learn in different ways. But if we can learn at, at, through being entertained at the same time, it, it, we tend to pay more attention, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shalan asked the question here and I wanted to hit this anyway, was, you know, you cleaning up your, your food and and. You mentioned, Whitney, that you were already kind of living clean, but now that you have eliminated the dyes, have the two of you seen any, noticed any difference in, in yourselves as, as adults with the removal of the dyes? Or do you think the bigger impact occurs for children? So I'll answer first. Um, so for me, I don't seem to have any reaction to dyes at all. Like if I eat something with dye... And I, you know, my moods don't seem to shift at all. Like my sleep doesn't seem to be affected. Um, so like, I, like I said, this isn't something that affects everybody. And it, and it's not necessarily the solution for every kid with behavior problems. Right. Yeah. But like, it's not, it's not the reason why kids have behavior issues, but the thing is, is it could be, mm -hmm. there's a possibility that it, there could be a link there and it's worth exploring. Um, yeah. But for me personally, like I, 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 I tend to avoid it as much as I can now because um, I, I just learn like the potential other 
bad things that aren't necessarily behavioral, but just like the health. Well, and he has a family history with cancer too. So it's just avoiding any carcinogenic foods. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, that's, so I don't really have a reaction, but Whitney, she's, she's a little different. She's, yeah. she's got a, I'm going to go, he left the water on in the bathroom. <laughs> I'm going to go turn it off and she can answer. That's fine. Yeah. So, um, it's it, honestly, researchers don't know a whole, whole lot about adults. There hasn't been any studies really on adults that I'm aware of. Um, but for me, I can anecdotally say that when I take a antibiotic that's red, like I, I don't really want to make a big deal about me. I will make a big deal about my son. I'll stay in the yeah. office until I have a prescription that I know is die free, but I don't want to cause waves just for me. So the last few times that I had an antibiotic, I had terrible insomnia, like, like lay awake at night, the whole night, just like hovering above myself almost. So I do think that I am reactive. I also have ADHD. So I, I have a few different layers um, yeah. on me that, that, that uh, makes me more vulnerable than I guess some people, but um, it is also a dose dependent thing. Um, so the more you eat, the more it affects you. Um, but also if you think about children, their size is much smaller. So a small right. amount of synthetic dyes can affect them more. So in general, adults seem to tolerate it a little bit better than kids. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that I'm reactive. Um, and some of the researchers that we've spoken to believe that there is like a, a connection, uh, like some kind of family connection, that it's a genetic link. Okay. Um, that's what they believe there. There haven't been any studies that have proven that, but um, I definitely think there's something to that. I also have myself and my son have several food allergies. Like I'm, I'm literally allergic to wheat and dairy. They cause allergic reactions in me. So it's not surprising that I would react to an additive like synthetic and dyes. And we've kind of seen not obviously not like it said, there's no like blueprint for this, but we have seen a lot of correlation with people who have not just, reactions to food dye but there are people that we talk to like in her she, she started a big facebook group and so there's a lot of people that will ask if their kids have any other like dietary like mm -hmm. allergies or anything like that it does seem to be common you see you see certain correlations yeah. and, and connections and again we're also kind of seeing correlations with like neurodivergency so like yeah obviously adhd there's a you know it seems to have be more gifted prevalent too and then like Anecdotally, we've aut autism difference. seems to have more prevalence with, with yeah. dyes. And also like we're, it's a running theory that we have that possibly even like gifted, like, you know, gifted is on the, the, you know, neurodivergent spectrum as well. Yeah. So we, we both have high IQs in, the, in our son, not that we've had his IQ tested, but in going through um, the behavior issues we had, we had him in behavior therapy. So we were working with a therapist to try to work through some of these behaviors. And um, once we eliminated dyes, they had concluded that he's a gifted, very smart child, but that he's just very sensitive to dyes. So there hasn't been any formal studies about giftedness and there hasn't been a ton of studies about autism just um in our group uh emily um emily put the group name in the comments so it's die free families and uh die free family and um but anyway we have uh, over twenty thousand parents so we we have lots of conversations and autism is one that seems to come up a lot yeah. of children that are sensitive to ADHD. it ADHD, there's a lot of, of data on ADHD yeah. and, and synthetic dyes. But one thing I also want to say is like, so a lot, I think a lot of people tend to look at parents like us who talk about these sort of things and think that we're just like super crunchy and like cuckoo. But the truth is, like I said, I, I don't, dyes don't really affect me at all. And even yeah. our daughter, our two-year-old, she doesn't seem to have yeah. any reaction. So yeah. it's not like we're just like, we're saying this stuff because, you know, we, we've read that it's bad and we shouldn't eat it. We've, yeah. we've experienced it. So we've seen it. Like It doesn't affect everybody. We've seen how much it actually does affect our son. And that's kind of what yeah. it's important. Well, and I think that adds credence to what you're saying, because it's not like you're developing an anti-dye cult. Right. You know, I mean, it's it, you're, you're sharing things from the standpoint of your own experience, um, academic and scientific research, and providing an opportunity for people to say, what should I at least be exploring to determine the impacts that, that this may have on me or members of my family? And I think that's important. I want to shift gears just a little bit in the time we have left. And uh, I'm going to say, mention that we're going to be uh, here in a moment. I'm going to be putting in our chat here uh, the, the links to your 
um, to die for website your we're going to talk about this the indiegogo as well in a minute as well as your facebook page and um so people have a starting point to kind of link to what you're doing and get more information but i, I did want to ask you what you know, to, to put this documentary together, it's not like you're just sitting in your house in Georgia and everybody's coming to you. You've had to do some, you've had to travel. You've had to travel in some cases fairly extensively in order to meet up with the people and, and put your film together. How has that affected daily life and business and family life to try to do that? How long have you been working on it and how, what's the impact been? So we started filming what? Emily, Actually, when did we film with you? Um, yeah. So, so our first, Emily was our second interview, but on our first trip. So yeah. I think Emily was our first person that we booked. Yeah. But she was the second person that we actually filmed. And uh, we found Emily um, through another group, right? Mm -hmm. about, uh, NBC had done an article on her. And if you haven't read Emily's NBC article, it'd be great if you link to that. It's a good, start, well. yeah, it's a good starting point. So Emily, if you if you have that link and you want to put that in the chat, that would be great. Otherwise, we'll make and we'll make sure the other thing is we'll make sure that all of this information and these links are also on the Coffee Breaks with Steve uh, Facebook page, so people can can go there and get them after the show or or find them if they're not tuned in today. But yeah, so talking about how long you've worked on this, so what uh, it, so what is so <laughs> October was when we first started filming. So we okay. planned for we thought about it. We've been thinking about it for probably a year at this point. Uh, so we, we finally started booking people and then started filming in October. But the, fir the very first trip, um, obviously, it was an idea at that point. Um, they were the only two people that we had booked so far. Um, but we, we knew that if we could get enough footage to put together some sort of like teaser and for fundraising, video. fundraising video that that we could... Uh, we could kind of get some momentum. So luckily our other, our first interview was with a, a lady Rebecca named Bevins. Rebecca Bevins, Dr. Rebecca Bevins. And she's, she's got a really big um, Ted talk that has a lot of views on YouTube. Uh, I think and it's actually, it changed Emily's life. Yeah, a lot. It's crazy. A lot of these, these parents that we're interviewing, a lot of them have a connection to her Ted mm -hmm. talk. So like, that's kind of where they got the initial information. Interesting. Okay. Bevins, Ted talk. So, uh, so connecting with her, was a really good kickoff point because she actually had a lot of the connections with the people that we have reached out to uh, with the Center for Science and Public Interest. She gave us that connection and that's kind of, it just kind of developed from there. But so that first trip was in October. We flew out to, um, let's see, Nevada, no, Utah, Utah and Nevada. Nevada. So then we flew into Nevada and then we drove to Utah. Then we flew back home. And then, then after that, we put together our, our uh, crowd, our crowdfunding campaign. We've raised about 11,000, close to 11,000 with, we had some people that gave to us just like in person and not on the platform. Um, but that was enough to almost cover our travel costs. Up, so, up to this point, it's covered other than that initial trip. We've probably invested about 5,000 of our own money to start to start going other than obviously I've got equipment, but that equipment I've had, you know, that's not, hasn't really that been that big of, that wasn't an investment for this film, but then we've raised about 10,000. So that's covered a good chunk of our travel we've got maybe one more trip's worth that we can do with that money um but that we've gone to washington dc uh virginia we just got back from uh texas and oklahoma in, Feb london, in february we're going to london to interview dr wow. stevenson uh then we're going to where so we have a trip planned for california where we're going to be interviewing Somewhere the senator, the senator out there who, who like proposed the bills in California. And then also there's a company out there that we're hoping to interview that's Microma. that's uh, that's developing a, a natural dye. That's pretty neat that that's uh, we don't I don't know a ton of information about it because we haven't actually interviewed them yet. So I don't want to misspeak on what it is, yep. that they do, but it's a it's a new way that they're doing dyes and. And it's pH balance. So yeah. that's that's what's different. Like so so natural dyes now you can't cook with them one to one. Um, they kind of lose their color. If some you... of them do. So some of them are they're not. That's that's kind of been a big argument from like yeah. big pharma and stuff and like and big food. Like uh, there's not a color natural color for some of them that can stand up to cooking or be pH stable and stuff like that. So this company's trying to develop pH stable natural dyes, which is pretty cool. And then uh, we've got another trip with Dr. Joel. It's up north. Joel Niggs. Minnesota. Nig. 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 Yeah. He's and he's a he's a he's one of our top of the line interviewees. So 
him and, and uh, Dr. Stevenson are like the world experts in this, this whole thing. So we're excited about those interviews. So yeah, it's been a lot of travel. A lot of work. I'm, I'm lot having work. to manually input about 250 emails a There's day. A, a lot wow. of, we, we are literally a two person crew. So yeah. yeah, a lot of these, docu- you know, a lot of sweat equity, even your, your low budget documentaries, a lot of times we're going to have film crews with, with yeah. you know, cameramen can, and AC. You're at least going to have, in most documentaries, you're at least going to have a small crew of, of half a dozen to a dozen people involved yeah. in various capacities. So just to, we, we're going to get short on time here. I do want to ask you, when do you think you're at this point, what's your timeline for completion of the film? And I know that that can be a moving target too, because you've got finished mm-hmm. filming and you got a lot of post-production that has to go into that. And you reach a point finally where it's, you're going to lock it and it's going to be in the can, but then what are your hopes or your goals or your dreams for getting it out in front of the public? So in a perfect world, we will be done by September. We'll have at least have a version, a draft that's good enough to submit to Sundance. So like if Sundance is a pipe dream. Obviously they get 14,000 submissions and only choose 150 or so. But uh, obviously that's like the, the top of the food chain. If you're going to go, you know, festival and stuff like that. So um, if, if we do get into Sundance, Sundance has to be the world premiere of the documentary. We can do some prime for some private premieres. Sure. Um, so if we get into Sundance, then it wouldn't actually come out until January of 2024, 24. Right. Um, if not though, like we're still exploring, we've got a, a, um, a distribution consultant that we're kind of talking with that we're once we get a little further into post-production and stuff like that, we'll start working with him. And uh, so our goal, I think is just, it's not really about making selling. I mean, if we sell the film to somewhere, that would be, I mean, that'd be great, but that's not our main goal. Our goal is as many people to see it as possible. So, so, you know, that's, that's kind of, we're going to try to track whatever doors open to make that happen is kind of where we're at. So, um, if that's a streaming service, if that's a, we have to self um, distribute or work with a distributor, like we're still figuring that out. Right, right now, our eye is on getting the film finished, making sure we have all of our legal ducks in a row because this is, you know, you know, that that those are things we never thought about before going into it. You know, every film needs a lawyer. On you got to make sure that you right. do things the right oh, way yeah. and all follow the right work. Yeah. And, which requires a lot more money than even we were anticipating. So we we've had we have almost enough to cover our travel, but we've applied for a grant, and if we don't get that grant, then it, we're going to have to pay for the rest of this okay. out of pocket. So we definitely still could um, use funds. So if anybody's listening that's passionate about it, so our Indie give Go- us your money. Our Indie Go- the, right the, the Indiegogo link is is in the comments right now, and it will also be up on my uh, on my pages following this show. So we'll have all of that information out there. You can go to Indiegogo. There are some perks if you want to do that. Yeah. If you're not super interested in perks and you just want to help out, we also have a PayPal link on our on our website that you can yeah. pay directly to. Obviously, Indiegogo is great. They helped us raise our funds, but they obviously take a percentage of what's donated. Right. So, um, anyway, but it's, it's it's also helpful. It's also helpful if people who are watching and listening to this want to look up your sites and then. Mm-hmm. Share that with other people, get the word out or get the word out about even this show today so people can come back and watch what we've talked about. And we are running out of time today, so I, I need to end this. But I will say this a couple of things. Number one, thank you so much for what you're doing. I know that it's a labor of love, but I also know it's a labor. And so con- continuing that good work and, and making a difference, not only for your own family, but for many, many other families through this. So thank you. Um, I will be following up with you on a couple of things and one of those just to put it out there right now that i'd love to be keeping up with you along the way and maybe have you back when we get closer to the fall and maybe you're closer to getting this uh, to production and and distribution and talk about that process and and where people can can hopefully by then have some idea of where we're getting ready to go to to actually see the the finished film if they go to your indiegogo page i also mentioned this there is a uh, a video on there it's also available on youtube that they can get a really good overview yeah. of the work that you've been doing it's about a five or six minute long introduction to yeah. to die for the documentary and so probably probably the best spot is probably the, our website so our website has the video too yes we got all the links to indiegogo and to Perfect. 
Facebook page and website is also on here. We'll make sure that that's available to everybody. So Whitney and Brandon, thank you so much for being here today, for sharing your story. Thank you to everybody who's been tuning in. Uh, I'm going to let you get back to your Saturday and get back to your kids and uh, we'll be following up with you soon, but thank you. And God bless you both. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to meet you. Bye everybody. All right, listen, I think that we, we need to be learning about things that, you know, I know that even though I've heard about some of these synthetic dyes over the year, the years, uh, it's still real easy to get, I don't know, we kind of tune a lot of things out. We hear so much information, that sometimes we're not paying enough attention to the things that might be most important and most meaningful for us. So uh, I was, when I first heard about Whitney and Brandon and their work through Emily, uh, and Emily, thanks for being on here today and being a part of the conversation. But it was it immediately sparked an interest in me to make sure that we gave them an opportunity to be here. So we'll make sure that this word continues to get out. I want to let you know what's coming up the next couple of weeks before we let you go and get on with your weekend as well. Next week, I mentioned uh, we were talking about birthdays and we were say, talking about Carol Siegel. I said that Jonathan was going to be back. Well, Jonathan is going to be back next week. And Jonathan is a musician. He is a, a piano player, a singer, a songwriter, and, and he's also a music educator. He gives lessons. He's taught music. But he recently finished writing a musical, his own musical um, called Space Vacation, the musical. And uh, I've had a chance to listen to it. He's posted the music for that on his website and some other places. It's fascinating. And so he's going to be back to talk about his musical next week, how that came about and where he hopes, where we can hopefully find a place to not only hear the music, but see it performed on stage at some point in the near future. And then in two weeks, a uh, dear friend and colleague of mine, Dee Dee Kiso, is going to be with us. She uh, is, is a person, she's one of these people that I just look at, and I am constantly wowed when I, I see what Dee Dee is doing and, and have conversations with her. Extremely creative, extraordinarily creative in taking her knowledge and her expertise and getting it in front of people. And we're going to be less talking about her expertise in the areas of nonprofit work and fundraising. And talking in a little more detail about when you've got knowledge, we all have carry knowledge, we're all experts in some way. How do we take that expertise and that knowledge and get it in front of people in a way that number one, doesn't make us people tune us out and roll their eyes because they say, well, you're acting like a know-it-all. Um, sometimes there's, there's a way to go about doing that so we don't come across as being better than others. But there's also times when we're putting things together from our knowledge base that's part of our business, part of getting uh, people lined up to be able to hire us to do work for them. How do you share knowledge without giving away the store? And so Dee Dee's going to be here to talk about that. And, and it's really, Dee Dee's a fantastic communicator. I think that you're going to enjoy her on here. Are there topics that you would like to see us cover? We uncover things all the time. We encounter people. We encounter topics. But you have great ideas. You are part of this conversation. This is your coffee table as well. So I encourage you to, again, uh, write to cbwsteve at comcast.net to share your ideas, share your thoughts about topics or people you would like to see on the show. It's always helpful if you know somebody you can make an introduction to as a guest, but uh, just your ideas are very helpful and appreciated. So I invite you to do that. And as we get ready to get on all of us with our weekends and get on with our week, you know, this has been a reminder today that we can all be advocates. We are all advocates for something because we have things we believe in. We have topics, we have causes, we have people we believe in. And sometimes it's on a big scale and sometimes it's simply the people who are around us and it's the situations that are around us. So as I remind you every week, please find a way to make a difference in your world this week. God bless you. Have a great week.